Well, Dan, welcome back to the show. Appreciate it, Cable. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, try to bring everybody up to speed on the political landscape of conservation in the West. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate that we even have to do these interviews, but they're extremely necessary. And I think it was maybe midsummer uh, when you came on the first time. And I've seen, man, you've been, dude, you've been making the rounds, just uh, hitting as many podcasts, doing as many uh, news interviews as you possibly can. I know it's a, it's a pretty demanding job. Somebody has to do it though. So first of all, thank you for that, uh, for spearheading the effort there. Because, and I think the, the thing that needs to be made clear is that, yes, this is in Colorado coming to the ballot in November, this hunting ban, and everyone wants to call it, oh, it's a trophy ban. No, it's a hunting ban. That's- and uh, the implications, though, are far uh, more broad reaching because if Colorado falls, and that's why I don't understand sometimes people in other states will like, well, that's Colorado. That's not my problem. Yeah. Yeah. It is all of our problem, big time problem for all of us. And it's coming to a state near you. Promise you that. So um, that's why it's so concerning. Uh, and I, you know, I've killed a mountain lion in Colorado. And I'd love for my son to be able to have that same experience someday if he wants to. So, um, yeah. Uh, and, and we've gotten to a point now the, I I don't know if it's empathy or sympathy. I mean, it's a combination of both. I think that when you look at the, the sportsman and minded conservation movement that we've created over the last century and a quarter, um, Mm -hmm. we've just taken a lot for granted that it's always going to be here. And even though we see attacks and assaults at different levels, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's alligator trapping or maybe it's foothold trapping in Montana or like what we had to deal with here in Colorado, the West is becoming the centric component of the predator uh, support movement from the antis. And, and I think that, mm-hmm. look, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, a, a predator opposer, uh, but I realize the balance when you get in, in the predator prey relationships and I consider myself to be a predator. Uh, I consider humans as, as a whole to be predators, even though some have chosen not to be uh, right. that used to be, it used to be the point that they didn't have, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago if you if you weren't a predator you sat in in the in the lodge or you sat in a cave and you waited for somebody who was a predator to bring stuff home to you <laughs> right um and while while some of that is still existent today we need to figure out a way to communicate our message as as predators as a whole as hunter gatherers um and i just i just did a podcast with clay Newcomb and, and those guys with bear grease and and got off on a tangent about you know the 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 way that we used to be to compare to the way that we are and, and maybe the way that we're going to be you know 150 or 200 years from now mm. but what we have to deal with is if we're going to be really carefully minded and thoughtfully um stewards uh thoughtfully minded stewards of our natural resources we have to be able to step up and prop that up and and to do that you have to be able to show why you do what you do where you came from and where we need to be able to continue to go to maintain predator-prey relationships on the landscape with a growing human population and a diminishing habitat mm-hmm. uh, and a variety of other things that affect predators and prey alike. Yeah. Well, I I, uh, I just had this guy on from the UK, from England last uh, last week. His name's Ed Swales, and he's founded this group called The Hunting Kind. And he is... And he was very clear. He's like, we have the best conservation model in existence in North America. He's like, we're very jealous because we don't have that. We didn't, we didn't have the foresight to implement something like that into place. Mm-hmm. He's like, you guys are very lucky. So don't screw it up. And here we are trying to screw it up. Right. Trying. Yeah. And to screw uh, it up. Yeah. So it is the best system in the world. It's, we have the greatest conservation in this country. I, you know, I've traveled to quite a few countries and, um, there's nothing that is like our, the way that we manage wildlife, sustainable use. Um, and it's, it's on the ballot coming up in November, um, yep. which we're going to talk a lot about. But uh, first, are you even going to have a chance to go elk hunting this fall? Or are you going to be no. so, yeah, so inundated with this that you're not even going to get to? No, we didn't even put in for licenses this year. I mean, just because of the, the I mean, this is, this has turned into a 14 to a 16 hour day, seven day a week venture. Yeah. Um, and and has has gained in uh, significance and importance over the course of the last eleven months, 
but no, my son and I didn't, didn't put in for anything other than a private land cow tag that I will probably run into as I'm opening a gate while I'm checking coyote traps, uh, on some ranches that I do damage control with. I mean, uh, it's a five month late season tag and it's not a hunting tag. It's, it's to keep the, the elk at bay to keep them off particular pieces of property. And, and, um, uh, you know, but, but I'll have, I'll have an elk rifle in a pickup and I'll have some orange in the truck when I'm trying <laughs> to work and trying to keep some of my customers happy, but, but there yeah. will be no elk or deer or sheep or moose or pheasant or duck season for us this year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I had to laugh when I, read the recent headline coming out of your state and it was like Colorado's going to relocate the relocated wolves because guess what they yeah. did <laughs> they depredated on too much livestock yeah. shocker yeah. i was like God, it's it's mm -hmm. laughable right i mean just absolutely so, so they're moving these this pack of wolves it's not a big pack it's like three or four wolves i think yeah it's a uh, it's a it's a male and a female and three pup, uh, pups and uh and and from all word on the street is they're not even relocating them to other areas at this point. They're relocating them more than likely to a animal sanctuary and then try to figure out what the hell to do with them, even though that the the definition of that might be violation of state law. That's not been yet finalized or determined. But uh they don't know what to do with them. And it <laughs> it just goes to show the the ballot box biology side of things that that when you force things upon agencies to do things that they're not fully prepared to do, even though there was a four-year plan in the works after the, the people vote, um, it's still not sufficient, especially when you get into a, a territory or a state like what Colorado is with 5.9 million people mm. and 84 million visitors, that you just take something from somewhere and put it and think that it's going to do exactly what you want, how you want, when you want, and it's not going to cause any problems or consternation. And, and all of that has proven to be the case, problems and consternation, and then knowing not, not what to do with it or how to do it legally and ethically and morally while well, being considerate of the wolves and the people that the wolves affect and adhering to state law because of the vote of the people and adhering to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and, and Wildlife Services, you know, state and federal regulations. I mean, the, <laughs> introducing wolves is one thing. Introducing wolves in a place that they shouldn't be now. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have ever been here before, right? but they shouldn't be here now unless they come here naturally. And, and that goes into the ballot box biology side of stuff cable that, that you just look at and go, how much more are we going to turn around and leave it up to the voters to make decisions on things that they have no interest in and yeah. they have no skin in the game when it comes to the management side or the understanding of how to make it good, better, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it summed it up beautifully. Here's here's what ballot box biology gets you. Is yes. let's relocate yeah. the relocated yeah. wolves. Uh... Like uh, nine months into the thing, it's like mm -hmm. ah, I was just I I giggled to myself when I saw. Well, it. and I even I'll even give a give a shout out to the people for ethical treatment of animals. I mean, it, you know. 99.9% .9 of the time, you and I would never agree with that particular group. Mm -hmm. However, they came out publicly and said, we disagree with translocation of, of species like wolves. And, mm -hmm. and to, to say that we agree on things is, is an anomaly in itself, but to agree for the right reasons is in is even more of an anomaly. And I yeah. think that that proves the point that ballot box biology is not the way to manage wildlife. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is the current situation? Proposition ninety one. I, I always thought they'd get the necessary. Actually, they changed it. Yeah, yeah. We, and you can educate us on that. But yes, I knew they would get the signatures because they're gonna. They go to places like Red Rocks Amphitheater and they put up a cute little sign and they say, "Here, sign this," and they don't tell the passerby or like what's actually what they're actually signing, which is a hunting ban. They're like, "Let's save big cats. They're endangered." Blah blah blah. Hunters are killing you know, clubbing kittens and all this BS, whatever they're telling them, they get the 200,000 something signatures. And now it's going to uh, the, the November ballot. And I know that it's no longer prop 91. It's called something else. And there's, there's it's actually 30. proposition 127. We just got the, okay. we, as, as we speak this morning on the morning of September 9th, we actually got the proposition number from the secretary of state's office this morning. So it's 127. Okay. Uh-huh. And have you had a chance to actually read it, the wording yet? 
Oh yeah, we, we I've I've read through every single section of this because we've been intimately involved in the in the language writing for the blue book and dealing with legislative counsel with our strategy teams and the attorneys and the campaign managers and and providing documentation back and forth at at a plethora of different levels. Uh, yeah, so the language remains the same in the measure itself from what it originally was back in January, December, and November of last year. It's the title that we got changed last year that okay. stuck with the Supreme Court, that that's what the voters are going to look at. And and to your point, Cable, um, it's not a trophy hunting ban. There's Trophy hunting is not in the title. Trophy hunting, the definition of trophy hunting is defined in the measure, which is the blue book that people will look at. But uh, the language stays the same to where this is a hunting ban. And while it provides exceptions to the rule that do not incorporate hunting, they have to deal with human health and safety and depredation and livestock and protection of private property and so forth, scientific reasons or whatever. But uh, there is no hunting component in, in this at all that will, will allow for a suitable, regulated offtake of an abundant wildlife species. And so it, it is completely a hunting ban. Mm -hmm. And what, there's something like uh, estimated 4,000-ish mountain lions in Colorado. Is that, yeah, they is say that... there's around 4,400 to the best estimate, not including kittens. Yeah. And so the kittens could, you know, actually, actually probably add another 600 to 1,600 or maybe 1,800, depending on what given year. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you got one or two or three per, per litter, uh, but somewhere around 4,400 and up. They don't include kittens because kittens aren't part of the scope of the model for management, so to speak, because if they got a suitable female population and a suitable male population, they know they're going to have reproductivity. And so the kittens are, are part of that component, um, but not really part of the numbers until they get to, to be sub-adults and kind of off on their own. Okay. And, and I think the number of cats taken by hunters is somewhere around like 400. Something like that. Uh, this this year, this past year was five hundred and two that were taken by hunters for a total of nineteen percent success. So you had mm -hmm. twenty five hundred and some odd licenses that were sold of uh, five hundred and two cats that were harvested through hunting, not through yeah. roadkill and not through depredation or, or livestock protection issues, but through hunting, which turned out to be a nineteen percent success rate. So that's eighty one percent of the guys that are out there that paying into the system. So we have a a manageable, sustainable, uh, high level population population and perpetuity mm -hmm. so less than 10 percent um when you're when you factor in the, the kittens and um you know sub-adults that's sustainable right there i mean it tells you all you need yeah. to know strictly managed yeah. um we I, you know when I, I spent 18 days hunting in your state for mountain lion over three mm -hmm. trips and we'd be hunting in one unit and then we get online and we got back and we're like oh that unit's closed because yep. we reached the quota so we got to go somewhere else yep um when i killed the cat the, the game warden came to our location, extracted a tooth, aged the cat, you know, took some, I don't know, some other DNA or something, maybe some hair. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but I mean, I couldn't even leave the state until that process had played out legally with my cat. So, yep. Same with bears and sheep yeah. and goat and moose. I mean, if, if, uh, if you harvest one of those big game animals in the state outside of deer, elk, and antelope, those animals have to be physically inspected by mm. the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and and they take the, the the certain samples like what you mentioned, but they also ask some questions and fill out a survey, and that helps compile the data that is necessary for ongoing uh, science-based management. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, so, what is the general mindset right now when you look across the hunting landscape in in this community of folks? Um, when we're talking about this. November ballot box initiative. W what is the reception that you're getting? Are people like just assuming oh, we're going to lose, so therefore I'm apathetic towards it, or are people, or, or is it the opposite? And people say well, there's no way that Coloradans are going to. They already screwed up on wolves. They're not going to run this back and screw up on mountain lions. And they, I don't. Well, think I think it's, it's. I think it's probably an even balance between the people that have paid attention and the the ones that don't don't until they actually open up the ballot book and go, holy cow, there's mountain lions in here. Uh, those, those are the people that we're most concerned with, obviously, because those are the ones that have a tendency to make a knee-jerk reaction by just checking a box. Hopefully they check the right box by checking no, 
Um, but if they've done any homework or they paid attention to any of the advertising that will be out there um, over the next 57 days, uh, hopefully they'll pay attention enough to, to make the right decision. But a lot of the ones that we're speaking with have concerns about the way Colorado has changed, but also the ignorance of the general public overall about education and wildlife, natural resources, habitat, water, land use, you know, oil and gas extraction, uh, logging. I mean, if you're not if you're not paying attention, it's hard to make an educated decision. You have an opinion, but the emotional side plays into a lot of the things because of the lies and fallacies and falsehoods of the opposition, which is cats aren't trophies at this point in time. That's the organization right. that we're fighting. And so while they're putting out lies, we don't try to turn around and tell people the truth. We say, hey, the facts are in the, the proof is in a pudding here. Go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and look at the studies. And look at the documentation. You, you don't don't question me because I'm not telling you what's right, wrong, or, or indifferent. And don't and but you should question the other ones because they're not referring you to the experts. They're saying yeah. that they're the experts, and we're trying to relate people back to the experts. And I think that that creates a significant amount of questioning or curiosities in in what we would consider to be the target audience, the voter. Mm-hmm. And you know, you look at you look at people's reasons of why they would vote for or or for against something, like they did on wolves. Yeah. Wolves passed by a fifty point nine percent to forty nine point one percent margin, and and we're seeing a fair amount of buyers remorse, so to speak, that people that voted for wolves have now seen four years of wolves in the news and depredation and conflict and try to attempt a conflict resolution and now relocation and a mountain lion killing a wolf and ranchers up in arms and different communities, you know, concerned about the well-being of their wildlife and domestic uh, agriculture production and the fighting, the infighting and the gag orders that, that, that have been uh, pending uh, with Colorado Parks and Wildlife from this gubernatorial administration to say, you don't say anything unless we tell you what to say. The general right. public looks at all this and processes some of this information, but some of it hits a nerve because a lot of them voted yes on wolves. And then they start to question, maybe I was wrong. Maybe right. me wanting to hear a wolf or maybe wanting to see a wolf if I ever got a chance to was not realistic in my expectations of what that was going to do for the rest of the state or the rest of the people that I was going to affect by checking this box. We're not saying that 90 million people, you know, would change their mind on anything when it comes to an election. But in this state, given this, we expect that there's going to be a percentage or two of people that voted for wolves that are likely to change their vote on this because of the way that wolves have been in the news and the sensationalism that wolves have brought to the conservation conversation over the course of the last four years. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a a uh, lifelong buddy who is from Texas. He he lives in Denver now, uh, actually in Golden. Um, but I asked him, I said, hey, Justin, when this ballot box thing comes to your state here in November, I need you to vote against it. He's like, yeah, but aren't mountain lions like good? And don't, shouldn't we not be like killing them? And I'm like, well, yeah, uh, mountain lions are cool and they belong in the landscape. And that's why you need to vote for hunters to be allowed to continue to do what they're doing and manage the population. And then he's like, well, you guys are like killing so many wolves in Wyoming. And like, I'm like, no, no. And I, and I sent him, <laughs> I sent him the data. I went and like got all, I said, here's how many wolves are in Wyoming. Here's how many actually are in, you know, Montana, Idaho. And we're not killing that many. Look, they're increasing in population every year, despite what trappers and hunters are able to take off the landscape Mm -hmm. he's like oh i didn't know that all i hear is like this he told me he's like this is just the general mindset that killing predators is bad and i just kind of believed it you know i'm like well so i've sent him those links to you know colorado parks and wildlife and stuff and yep if he can get his emotions out of the equation and the lies like for for example uh i was just pulling up the uh cats aren't trophies colorado instagram page one of their slides says 88% of Coloradans oppose trophy hunting lions with packs of dogs. Okay. I doubt 88% of Coloradans are against that actually. So where do they come up with that stat? seems like they're just they, making stuff up. It, it, well, and I think, it, you know, 
you can get whatever answer you want, depending on where you go. I mean, if you go to a farmer's market in, in downtown Pueblo, Colorado, versus a farmer's market in Boulder, Colorado, uh, you could probably skew the numbers significantly. And if you mm -hmm. ask the question, whatever the question might be, in a particular way, you can extrapolate that and, and dice it to the point where you get pretty much whatever answer you want. One thing that I've seen through all the polls and the data that I've been made aware of over the course of the last 20 years of my adult life is when they ask a question about, do you, do you, do you agree? Do you strongly agree? Do you, are you neutral? Do you strongly disagree or do you disagree? The top three are always categorized as one section and the bottom three are always categorized in another section. Even the neutrality goes into one side or the other, depending on how one asks and how one answers the question. Mm -hmm. And so you can get you can get an answer to say whatever the heck you want when it comes to these sorts of things. And the interpretation of people's perceptions of the news and stories, depending on what reporter gives it and what the ulterior motive is and what is omitted or what is included in those reports, skew people's minds and mentalities especially when it comes to cute furry cuddly stuff i mean when you're yeah. turning around and asking a question about mountain lions and how that might be a safety issue but the storyline has a picture of three kittens that are rumbling and playing visually optically you've already created something you know some sort of endorphin or algorithm in somebody's head to say oh no i don't i don't think they're, they're a threat i don't feel that that that's a serious issue but if you showed a mountain lion actually sitting there eating a the sheep while it's alive or maybe grabbing somebody's dog on a ring doorbell camera, then mm. people's perceptions automatically change. Yeah. Well, and there's been two instances in Los Angeles, California, just in the last month that, that I remember. One, this yep. this guy's walk, or it might have been a woman. They're walking their pit bull. Pit bull attacked in the street by a mountain lion, killed right in front of them. The cat's laying there just trying to eat the damn thing in, in the suburb mm -hmm. of Los Angeles. And then last week, a five-year-old was attacked yep. on a walk. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, Colorado, pay attention to what's going on here. This is this is coming to Denver. This is coming to Boulder. Uh, these cats, if we if we just all of a sudden stop killing 10% of the population every year, well, that, that population is going to go up significantly. And it's not going to take long. And uh and and meanwhile. We have another uh, this this post here, and I don't know if there's any worse entity out there as far as like a green decoy than Sierra Club. They I think they once were pro hunting, but that's long gone. They've got the uh, Colorado ecologist here, uh, Delia Malone. She says trophy killing of mountain lions contradicts contradicts the science, is ethically yeah. wrong and should be outlawed. What science does it contradict? What is it contradicts their science? That's, they, the, they, that's the lies, yeah. right? Those are the yeah. lies. It doesn't yeah, contradict no. any science. Colorado Parks and Wildlife says the exact opposite on their website with their data. And these particular special interest groups that have decided to bring this up never wanted to talk, talk about the science. They never re refer to the actual science of mountain lions in the state of Colorado. It's their mm -hmm. science. These are the same people that we've been arguing with and fighting with and having altercations with over the course of the last you know, 60 years in the state, depending on how old each one of those individuals are. Delia Malone is one of the most outspoken individuals you could possibly get from the Sierra Club. And mm -hmm. her facts and data as a psychologist or an ecologist or an environmentalist or whatever tag she puts on for whatever group that she's presenting to, um, you know, they all have, have their stick on how to capitalize on words that the opposition, their opposition uses. When we talk about follow the science, they turn around and try to capitalize that and then bastardize it on our side, but then pedestalize it on their side. Oh, yeah, we agree with the science. We just don't agree with that science. We don't agree with the expert scientists. We agree with our scientists, people that have never actually done a study, yeah. people that have never actually had any interactions with mountain lions over a five or six or eight or 10 year you know, span or period like what, what the experts in CPW have done. So it's easy to turn around and criticize somebody else when there's there nobody else like cpw to turn around and rebut or refute because of the gag order so it's mm -hmm. easy for them to turn around and say cpw doesn't know what the hell they're talking about because they know cpw can't come out and say yes we do know what the hell we're talking about so it's up to the sportsmen and women to the conservation groups to the hook and bullet crowd 
to use the facts of CPW and put that out because they've been given direct orders from the gubernatorial office and administration to say, oh, we have no position. It's not a neutral position. It's right. not a pro position. It's it's no position. And those are things that, that the antis are able to capitalize off of here and other places because of the politics and the emotions that have gotten into wildlife management. But meanwhile, your I, I don't know if he's referred to as a big cat program leader or large carnivore. The guy that had the PowerPoint. Um, the Mark Vera. Guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, in his presentation, he yeah. – he made it very clear that hunting is a viable component to mountain lion management. And, yeah, yeah, and uh, and you ought to see the backlash right now from the organizations that oppose that mentality. That that he came out and he was he was showing favoritism to the sporting community. He was showing favoritism to the science, and he's right. a scientist. And yeah. <laughs> and and some of the stuff that we've kicked out over the course of the last three or four weeks, specifically with Mark on the hot mic at a Parks and Wildlife Commission meeting on the 23rd of August. Some of that stuff's on our Instagram, but I would encourage anybody to turn around and go to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife YouTube page and watch the meeting on August 23rd and look at not just the lion discussion, look at the wolf discussion. Look at the way that CPW has to navigate and appropriately thread that needle through this wolf conversation to be politically correct, not emotionally driven, but really not fact-based either because the way that the opposition is coming at them through this gubernatorial administration is such to where they're trying to chokehold them and they're trying to strangle them to the point to where they can't say what the science is. Mark came out on the, on the mountain lion stuff and said what the science was and gave the facts and the data of what they're trying to accomplish with an East Slope mountain lion management plan and the way that the West Slope mountain lion management plan worked and how that's all incorporated into science of why life management, specifically mountain lions in Colorado, but the antis hate that. They despise the facts being delivered because they were told that there was going to be a gag order and nobody could talk about it. But when the scientists get up there and start talking about a management plan, stop and think about this. And, and this is good for any audience to listen to, Cable. Not one anti-group showed up to that meeting to dispute Mark Vieira's testimony on the East Slope Mountain Lion Management Plan. Not one provided written or verbal in-person comment to thwart or refute Mark Vieira's carnivore background and specialist to be able to turn around and present to the Parks and Wildlife Commission. Why is that? Because they didn't want to get in front of anybody on a hot mic to turn around and argue the science because then they would have to turn around and put themselves into a corner and those are things that people need to realize that when CBW comes out like that or any game agency comes out like that and nobody from the opposition shows up, it's because they don't want to argue the facts with the experts. I'm sure that that didn't make uh, Governor Polis's husband happy to have that presentation. <laughs> no, <Okay. laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, the the proof is in the pudding on a lot of this stuff. And you're going to find out that, that ulterior motives and intended agendas are going to continue to happen in some capacity, but science will prevail in the long run. Whether we're capable of actually being able to provide that information and documentation or not, it will prevail whether people want it to be or not. Mm -hmm. Well, so heading into the actual vote, what is your, you, you're saying maybe one or 2% of people that voted for Wolf for introduction are, they have buyer's remorse on that. And all we need yes. is one or two percent, right? Um, so, do you feel good about the prospect of of getting this defeated? I think, I think overall the campaign feels good, knowing full well that wolves has helped us because it's the most recent thing in the last four years that people had a chance to check the box on. And over the last four years, they've been able to see whether they're happy with that, or mm -hmm. whether they're displeased with that or whether they have a middle-of-the-road level of consternation with that. I think it makes people think a little bit more seriously, even though they might not know about it right now on the Mount Lion and Bobcat deal. When the advertisements start coming out from both sides, I think that there's a certain amount of people that are going to come out and say, wait a minute, I don't know everything about this, but why should I have a say in any of it? Wait a minute, look at what I voted on in Wolves in 2020, and that didn't seem to come out right. Why should I be able to sit here and check the box to make this happen 
when I don't actually know anything about it except for what maybe I have an opinion on. I think people are, are coming to the middle of the road more frequently than what we had anticipated because of the wolf. And I think that as we gain momentum and steam in this, some of the cracks in the chink in the armor from the opposition are going to be revealed because they don't want the facts out there. They want their facts. They don't want the data to come out because they want their data. They don't want the arguments to come out because we have the historical relevance of the last 65 years of mountain lion management in the state of Colorado that they can't rebut or refute. They might not want us to kill anything, but they can't rebut or refute the fact that because we've been harvesting wildlife and managing wildlife in that capacity since 1965 on mountain lions, that we've got a thriving, abundant mountain lion population. And while they say, oh, they're going to go extinct, how do you mm -hmm. justify that to a person that really understands numbers or cares about logic and reason and science? And I don't think the antis have a prayer when it comes to arguing that. It's just a matter of whether we can get that message out to the general public and the voter who's going to make a difference. Well, and I think that might be our biggest struggle is, you know, you and I talking it, it is a little bit of a, an echo chamber. You're talking on another podcast like Bear Grease. Well, anti-hunters aren't listening to Bear Grease, you know, any more than they're listening to a Ducks Unlimited podcast or any other outdoor podcast. So that's the, that's the problem. And with the censorship on social media, I mean, I've been looking at it for four years. Instagram hates me. Facebook blocks me at every, every turn. So my content's not really delivered to folks that aren't already following me. So how do we get that messaging out to the general public? Because it's great. And our listeners want to be as informed as possible on these topics. But I mean, what is, what is the message? Do, you need to have conversations with your, not your anti-hunting friend, but your, your buddy that's on the fence. Like the, the guy I was trying to talk to in Denver. Uh, is, is that the key? Or is it when we make a big, a, a huge marketing push here with advertisements that's going to be more mainstream. What is the plan? Well, I mean, the, 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 the scope of a campaign, which people have to have to realize is, is you don't want to peak too soon, but you don't want to turn on and give out misinformation. And mm -hmm. until this morning, when we just got proposition 127, as opposed to initiative 91, we've been talking to our stakeholders over the course of the last 11 months. And with all due respect, our stakeholders overall, overall, if they're not selfish, they don't pay attention. If they do pay attention, they only pay attention to part of it. And the reason being is because we have we have state and county lines that that automatically intentionally or unintentionally divide us. You brought it up. It's in Colorado. Why do I care? Well, right. you should care because about 700,000 people apply for licenses in the state of Colorado that don't live in Colorado. You should care because if you like to recreate in Colorado, or if you like to know that Colorado still has the number one elk population in the world and that wildlife is being appropriately managed, that if it, if it is eroded and degraded to the point to where we don't any longer, then when they get done accomplishing what they want to do here, how are you going to turn around and protect your state, whether it's Wyoming or Ohio? It doesn't matter. People in our circle, we talk about the North American model of wildlife conservation. Talking to our sector is just as important 11 months out of the year as talking to the, the target audience, the voting audience, one month out of the year. But the problem is we need to turn around and be talking to everybody 12 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think that doing that from the perspective that we brought to the table over the course of the last 11 months during the initial stages of this campaign, to the fight, to the Supreme Court, through the decline to sign, through the signature gathering, the circulation, the canvassing, the, the, sec the Secretary of State and the title board and the Legislative Council, there's a ton of stuff that goes on that you can't start messaging to that 80% until you have a number. Nobody last year is going to remember what the hell's going on this November until it's in front of them with a ballot in front of them to sit and say, I get a chance to show my ignorance or my education and vote right or wrong on this particular ballot. When it comes to the sporting community, what we've seen is a movement, a monumental, epic movement on our side to be able to come together as, as more, more or as much as anything that's ever happened in the United States when it comes to a ballot initiative to try to get people on board to get them to understand the way that this is written. It's not a mountain lion or a bobcat deal. That's the number one message. Right. It's a hunting deal. 
And the way that it can set a statutory precedent or a definition can translate into any other thing. Perfect example. There was an article in the Pagosa Daily Mail, I think, uh, last mm, two days ago. So for those listening, it would be like the 7th or the 6th of September. The guy said, why are turkeys any more important or any less important than mountain lions? I think we need to ban turkey hunting. Uh, okay. How many states back east are big turkey states? How many states back east are big whitetail states? How many states back east are big bear states or whatever the case might be? This is centric that we have to be talking to our audience at every single level so we can afford the luxury of being able to talk to the target audience. And when we start into the campaign on the target audience, our side, our community is likely to see some of that advertisement, some of that outreach and education, but they're not going to see all of it because they're not the target audience. You know, today's environment, you just mentioned it, Instagram and Facebook. Do we get some followers? Yeah. Do we get some non-followers? Yeah. Do we get some antis? Yeah. But the scope of the message is directed to the hook and bullet crowd and community, because we know that without their support, whether it's in state or out of state, there's no way, shape or form that we can obtain a victory. So making sure that our team is on the same page to be able to fund and message and create outreach and education. Me talking to guys like Bear Grease, me talking to guys like Steve Vanella, you, the Howl for Wildlife guys, the, the Rock Slide, you know, Cameron Haynes, you, 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 Randy Newberg, Jason Matzinger, you name, we, we've been in front of every single audience we could possibly be on except Joe Rogan. And we still have people on our side, on the hook and bullet side say, oh, I heard something's going on in Colorado. What yeah. is that? I thought you beat that before. Oh, that'll never happen. Oh, it doesn't bother me because I killed a mountain lion or I don't hunt mountain lions. I just hunt birds. I use dogs for that. You have to connect the dots with our community so they have the armament and the education to be able to talk to the non-hunting community, not the anti. We all, all agree that there's no sense in talking to the majority of them, even though some of them can be educated as well. But without our community base that we've created that can feed other levels of community, whether it's turkeys, whether it's bighorn sheep, or whether it's mountain lions in another state, creating this network and this coalition, this collaboration effort that we've been able to do helps us be able to talk to the overwhelming number of non-hunters because hunters themselves know a lot of non-hunters and non-hunters respect for the most part, the hunters that they know and they trust them and they feel that there's a connectivity to the landscape from them. There's a lot of things that we're learning through this whole process. And I think sportsmen as a whole have taken it for granted over the course of the last 50 years. We just don't pay attention to what the non-hunters think or believe or what they perceive. And we need to, we need to get them on our side of the fence, whether they decide to hunt or not. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Joe Rogan. Um, have we reached, I'm sure we've reached out to them. Have they contacted us? Oh, yeah. No, no. It, I mean, I know Renella has reached out. I know Cameron Haynes has reached out. Um, I know that Clay Newcomb has reached out and some others. Uh, we've reached out ourselves and, and to no response, but you know, that's not, you know, stop and think about this, even though it's a hunting ban, if I was Joe Rogan and I had, you know, 11 million viewers and, you know, 35 million followers or whatever, and talking about 2,500 mountain lion licenses in the state of Colorado would probably be the least on my level unless I fully understood the repercussions or ramifications. Now, sending Joe Rogan articles like what was in the Pagosa Daily Mail the other day about turkeys or about last last year when Tris Zornio with the Colorado Sun did another article about why are bighorn sheep any more important or any less important than mountain lions? Why are we hunting the state animal? If you can start to connect the dots at different levels, I think guys like Tucker Carlson, Jesse Waters, Joe Rogan, will start to pay attention that this this, this is an attack on the North American model and science-based wildlife management. It doesn't have anything to do with mountain lions and bobcats, except for that's the key phrase that they're using at this particular time. Mm -hmm. Now, Joe's in the middle of the road. Tucker, Jesse, certainly on the right. Why don't, why would you not say, uh, some Rachel Maddow or somebody from CNN or MSNBC? Why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they take this on? And I'm asking, I would love to be able to sit down. Yeah. Uh, I'd question. love to be able to have that, that conversation. We've got some experts that we could put on, or you could put my dumb bearded ass on there and, and, and we could, we could 
more than, more than happy to have those conversations. However, looking at the Denver and Colorado media it by itself, most of the things that have come out have been skewed to the proponents of this particular measure. And even when they're given the facts, a lot of times they, they, they discredit those, they throw them aside, or they take subsections of interviews and articles and they utilize that. I'm not saying it's all like against us, but it's definitely not for us. Mm -hmm. And while I have a debate that I'm doing with the opposition on Thursday, the 12th, with the Colorado Business Roundtable, it's going to be interesting to see who they actually send from the opposition to talk about this and, and what direction they want to go. Because historically, they don't want to turn around and sit and, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe and punch for punch or tit for tat with our side because yeah. we always refer back to the experts, the science, the data that's there. And they find that completely insulting, and, and there's no way for them to counter that. Yeah, no, you can't. It's, you know, facts over emotions. So yeah, at the end of the day, they don't have a leg to stand on. Um, I don't, I still have this weird, I don't even know how to describe it other than there's this, there's this faction in American sporting culture of folks who value public land over the second amendment in, in my in my opinion, like over science-based wildlife management, because we know the left is responsible for 99.9% .9 of anti-hunting legislation that's introduced in this country. Also, mm -hmm. the same goes holds true for guns, right? It's coming from one side of the aisle. And I've gotten to this debate with, with uh, someone we both know recently, and someone said, well, if you want to say goodbye to public lands, vote Republican. And I was like, if you want to say goodbye to hunting, vote Democrat. Like, I, yeah. I get it. The conservatives have work to do on public land. I admit that. I've had Senator Ted Cruz on the show before, and I've kind of beat him up on that one thing. I was like, look, I like most of your policies. Where I don't agree with you is the public land thing. So we could do better on that. But what do I need public land for? I don't, I want to go hiking. I want to have a gun in my hand when I'm hiking, whether I'm grouse hunting, elk hunting, whatever. And if I can't hunt, I don't, what, what, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not going there <laughs> for bird watching. Yeah. I like watching birds while I'm hunting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I just don't understand like why we yeah. would put the precedent on public land over the right to hunt. But uh, it seems like that's this, it blows my mind that we still have that many sportsmen that are just, they, for me, they can't see the forest for the trees. Like, and I don't need the forest if I don't have my gun. So I don't know. It's weird. Thing. Well, I think, I think, I think some of that comes into play too, is that, you know, for Colorado, for instance, there's 97, percent studies have found that 97 percent of the residents of the state of colorado engage in some sort of outdoor recreation they're outdoor recreationists maybe they're maybe they're mutualist mutualistic environmentalist or maybe they're just adventurist or whatever but but they and they engage in outdoor recreation to them some of that might be bird watching some of it yeah. might be uh flower counting some of it might be walking your dog on open space space where there's very little wildlife because mm -hmm. it's just it's just open space in and around the city of denver or boulder or maybe some other mountain community where they've created open space for people to turn around and, and be able to get outside and breathe fresh air and take a walk i don't have a problem with any of that but that doesn't have anything to do with conservation it doesn't have anything to do with habitat restoration and and solidifying the landscape for wildlife resources just because you have deer there does not mean that it's suitable habitat we've got deer in town we've got right. deer in major cities uh, just because you have open space does not mean that that's wildlife habitat and and i think that creating this connection between conservation and recreation and and habitat stewardship is something that we haven't done a very good job of holistically because we we spend a lot of time on the six or seven weeks out of a season that we're actually in the field. We might go scout. We might go recreate. We might do a variety of other things from the hunting and fishing perspective. But recreationists recreate essentially in some capacity 365 days a year. Mm. And sportsmen and women typically don't. And if they do, they do big game here. And then they go some other form of big game there. And then they go waterfowl over here and then they might go small game over here. Why? Because not all habitat is suitable for all of that stuff, right. but you can recreate wherever the heck you want to recreate mm -hmm. and you can recreate at any given time. You don't have to worry about a season. You don't have to pay a fee. You don't have any 
objectional uh, uh, objection from the general public to let you go ride your mountain bike at a specific time or ride your snowmobile. You have to have snow and you have to have a permit. But there's things that you do just to be able to recreate outside that you don't have to do when it comes to hunting and fishing. Mm-hmm. And and I think that the main scope of that is two things. We have to buy a license to hunt and fish. And the intent is to harvest, whether we decide to kill or we decide to release or decide not to harvest. The intent is to kill. And if you read the intent of what the measure is on the hunting ban, trophy hunting is defined as intentionally killing, wounding, stalking, pursuing, or entrapping a mountain lion or bobcat. That's their definition. And they're already Mm -hmm. bastardizing us if they get that definition through the books and let the people vote on it because they are allowing people to define what hunting is by their definition of trophy hunting, which in quotations means it's bad. And we are the bastards on the landscape. We're the ugly redheaded stepchild because we are trying to do what we do by hunting. And they've already classified it as, as trophy hunting. Those are things that we can't get away from because the overall goal is to harvest. The Mm -hmm. overall goal, the, the intent is to kill something. Now, a lot of us don't for a variety of different reasons, but that doesn't stop us from buying the license and being the bad guy in orange or in camo with a bow or a gun to be able to sit out there in hopes of taking home the prize that we want to eat and that we maybe want to mount or that we want to turn around and take pictures of. To them, that's the Antichrist when it comes to conservation because their ideology of conservation is let it be, rewild it, let it sit on the landscape. Nobody touches it. And for that matter, maybe nobody should be on the landscape in the grand scheme of things as it is. Yeah, see Alaska for for updates on on that, how to uh, take millions of acres and make it yeah. accessible to, uh, to caribou and moose hunters without any science to back it up. And you could thank Deb Howland for that, who wouldn't commit to a no-net loss yep. policy on, uh, on hunting. SCI tried to pin her down, and she skirted the question, of course. And here we are. Um, yep. So... No, that's what that's what you get when when that and that's why I'm saying when you vote this certain way, there are consequences as a sportsman. So I don't know. I think conservatives we need to do better on public land, but it's for me. There's no. I just don't see how anyone could vote against guns and against hunting and say that's my passion. That's what I live for. But I don't know. It's a well. We get we get people all the time out. right now that that are that are that are you know they claim to be sportsmen and women that are adamantly opposed to the utilization of the cruel tactics to pursue a mountain lion or or in Colorado to be able to trap a bobcat. Mm-hmm. Well, people that don't know, we can only use cage trap in the state of Colorado because they banned trapping in 1996. So right. if you want to recreate on public or private land and capture an animal, it has to be in a cage. Those are the same things that we we held the wolves in to be able to bring them here it was a cage. That's the same thing that we turn around and, and capture mountain lions and bobcats and a variety of other animals for conflict resolution or for studies in cages. But they, they want to stop that practice because they don't want us to have the opportunity to catch it and possibly harvest it. They don't want us to use hounds because they think that's cruel and unfair and inhumane. But they, they go f- one step further in the language, not in the title but in the language that you won't be able to use electronic collars and tracking devices and GPS coordinate devices. We won't be able to use any of that because that's cruel, unfair, and inhumane. Now stop and think how many bird hunters, how many waterfowl hunters, how many coon hunters, how many rabbit hunters anymore don't have a training collar on their dog. How right. many people that go in the woods just to walk don't have a training collar on their dog They want to make that stuff all legal because it's cruel and inhumane. And the regular general public does not consider, I have a bark collar on my dog. That's fine. But I don't want you to use a tracking collar to know where your lion dog is to find out if he's on the right property or to find out if he's at a tree or to find out if he's at a particular location that you need to call him off of. No, that's cruel and inhumane and it's unfair. Mm -hmm. But I can use these tactics here when I go recreate in open space just to be able to turn around and know that my dog is under confined. That, that the hypocrisy of what we've created is we haven't told a very good enough story to ourselves and to the opposition and to the non-hunter to let them know that all of this stuff comes into play. No matter how you look at it, we all use the same tools for the same reasons. It's just different end results is what we're trying to accomplish. Well, and, and you didn't even hit on the fact that 
hounds are the best way to actually make sure you're harvesting the right cat because you can sex it. The good, the, you know, good houndsman knows how old within a year or two a cat is. You can say, oh, that's mature. That's immature. Well, just by looking at the track. Yeah. But, you know, okay, so so maybe you're free casting and then you you end up treating a female, different track, whatever, dogs get separated. Bet. But you, but you a guy is going to be able to look at it and say, nah, we're not, that's a female, we're going to let it go. Mm -hmm. So now, hounds actually help you decide now, now to that, take which cat, the right cat. Exactly. And, the and, and people need to understand that a lot of the female cats that have been harvested in the state of Colorado, a significant proportion of those cats are sub-adult cats. They're non-breeding females. So when you talk about the breeding females versus non-breeding females, that's a, that's an intricate piece of the puzzle that the agency has utilized to thread that needle to look at suitable offtake and what mm -hmm. you can sustain off of the t entire population statewide to be able to say, we are doing this reasonably, ethically, morally, and scientifically to get the facts and the data. Mark Vieira, that last deal that I referenced on August 23rd, his presentation was so meticulous in being able to explain the utilization of hounds, which, by the way, they use for the scientific side of things as well. But the utilization of hounds in the case of mountain lions has been undeniably the best thing to increase mountain lion management and population over the course of the last 65 years. Mm -hmm. But because they don't get a chance to say that often enough, because they've got a gag order, the opposition uses that against us at every single level and every houndsman and every hound organization and every sportsman that realizes and understands the science component of, the, component of this needs to turn around and prop up that fact and that data and the science and utilize that stuff that CPW has put out there through their, through their science. They haven't done it for propaganda. They've mm -hmm. done it because they're reporting and the facts and the data and the statistics that are out there, and the opposition doesn't want that to be utilized or referenced in any way, shape, or form. Right. So, and I have a, a personal anecdote. So, I told you I did 18 days. It was over three different trips, same same outfit. I wanted to do dry ground. That was something that was really appealing to me. And the first uh, trip, I came in the spring. That season's gone, but we, uh, we didn't have success there. It like, rained every day. It was, conditions were bad. I came back in the snow the next year. And we caught three females, and we let all three of those cats go. I came back uh, in December of the following year, and it, there wasn't any snow. And so we ended up um, – a landowner had contacted us, a rancher, and he'd had two foals killed by a mountain lion. And he said, here's the deal. Whatever you catch, you have to kill it because I, they're not going to stop killing my livestock once they've started. And so we ended, it, it, it was a female, but – the the outfitter looked at me and he's like, I've killed one mountain lion in my life. One. I've treated hundreds of cats. I've killed one. That's it. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. like, if you don't kill this cat, I have to. And then we have to go kill another cat. And he's like, and, and I, that's fine. If you want, if you want to, if you have your heart set on a huge tom, then that's what we'll do. And I was like, dude, we caught this cat. It's a problem. We did it on dry ground, which is really the only thing I, that was the number one thing I wanted. And we did it. The dogs were awesome, and you know this is day eighteen now. I think we've, I think this is okay. I think this is the right cat. This is the right situation. Yeah, so I ended yeah. up, the stars I, aligned. Yeah, I ended up taking that female, but we let previously we let three other females go, you know, and and I chose to kill that female because I didn't want to have to go kill a, another one. Or, well, Cable, you you team. you just laid the story out of what I was talking about about the nineteen percent success because yeah. if you if you'd have done that the first year and quit or the second year and quit, you would have been part of that 81% unsuccessful bunch. Right. right. You know, I mean, you look at, you look at, you, you know, people talk about the unfair advantage that humans have. Well, a lot of that is because we have a brain and we have uh, tools and we have the ability to take time off and do what we need to do, where we need to get, do and how we need to do it. But if you really want to look at what we have as far as our, our success rate, 9% on elk in the state of Colorado, hmm. roughly 18 to 19% on deer, 19% on lions, roughly 26, 27% on bears. Uh, it's about 50, 50 on bighorn sheep. I mean, this is not a gimme. Right. 
with all the science and the and the the new advancements and technological things that we've created over the course of the last hundred years for man to be able to turn around and go out from from the optic side or from the bullet side or the the compound arrow and the broadhead side and the tree stands and the trail cameras and all. And we're still talking about like 10 and 12 and 15 and 19% on these species. There's mm-hmm. a reason that we hunt and it's because it's, it, it challenges us. Some of us are better than, than others. And some of us are better at some things than others. Some of us just get lucky and some of us have more time, effort, and money to be able to put into stuff. But if we depended on all of this straight across the board, you know, I think, you know, one of the statements I made before that if we could go to the supermarket and only be successful 9% of the time, and we had to draw for the opportunity to go to the supermarket and then and stand in line, and then you could only walk through and you're only successful 9% of the time, mm-hmm. people would look at the other options besides going to Walmart or Whole Foods because you didn't know whether you're actually going to be able to turn around and go pick st- stuff. You yeah. wouldn't, I mean, you know, that it is, it's, it's a hypocritical facetious statement, but the reason we do what we do is not just so we can support our family because there's means to be able to do that. But some of us like to do it differently. Right. And some of us, when you try to explain things like what Shane Mahoney with the wild harvest initiative has brought up, if you haven't looked at the wild harvest initiative, I would encourage your listeners to research it because Shane has come up with a formula that is worldwide that without wild harvest hence the wild harvest initiative we're not talking about just death and destruction without raspberries and pinion nuts and firewood and deer antlers and and fish and crustaceans and and it, without us being able to turn around and supply a significant amount of the worldwide food supply off out of the wild we could not supply enough food to feed through the domestic process through the agricultural process of of humanity we couldn't. Mm-hmm. So why not why not manage that so appropriately and why not emulate what we've created here in North America to make sure that we have wildlife resources and habitat conservation opportunities and resources in perpetuity. If we've accomplished what we've accomplished in the last 125 years, think if we continue at this rate as opposed to trying to backpedal and take it off the table continue to put more things on the table and continue to have more resources available because the human population is going to continue to grow. We Mm -hmm. need to make sure that we have the wildlife populations continue to grow with that steward mindset as opposed to putting it on a shelf like a canned preserve and never ever ever touching the damn thing. Yeah. And I think those are part of the message that we, that we can actually probably push hard enough through our, through our community, through the hook and bullet crowd. We just don't do a very good job of it because we take it for granted. Well, and you, you mentioned some of those success rates just in Colorado. And, you know, I said, I don't want to go bird watching, like, but half the time we're really just bird watching. We're not successful. And I, and you know, <laughs> you're I, taking I, your I made, gun for a walk. <laughs> I, I, I painted this picture. Like, I don't like birds, dude. I have, I have three, I was looking for one on the shelf close to me. I could grab it, but uh, I've got three just birds of North America books on my shelf. And when I see one that I've never seen before, I go look for it. And then I mark where I saw it, when, when I saw it, something my, my dad's a bass fisherman. He's not a hunter. So that was something I did as a kid is that was before I picked up a gun and started wanting, you know, to shoot the birds. Uh, mm-hmm. But we, we were just ID them. And that was something cool that we did together. Yeah. Um, and it's fun to go back and look at like, oh, I saw this, this hawk at Carlsbad Caverns eat, catching bats when the bats uh-huh. left the cave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I do love bird watching, but you know, these days it's like, I want to, be hunting while I'm bird watching. Well, since, since you're talking, stand, you know, whatever. Oh yeah, since you're talking about birds, real quick. I mean, I, when I went down to do the Bear Grease podcast a couple of weeks ago at the end of August, and uh, I, I needed to do a, a, a social post real quick because I had a, a full boat coming up with the Robbie Kroger Blood Origins uh, debut of Lionheart in Denver, and we were doing mm-hmm. some things with Brand McDuff in Denver, and it was a full week. And I stopped there at this school in West Fork, Arkansas. And I just pulled up behind the ball field and, and there on the fence, uh, were, were three Cardinals and one Oriole. And I thought that that was comical. Cause that's a, here. You got this ball field at the high school oh, and yeah. you got three Cardinals, which is St. Louis Cardinals and the Barth Baltimore Orioles. But the, but the, the fact of the matter is we don't have either one of those in Colorado and, and to see those birds while I'm getting ready to do this podcast or this, this update from the podcast and my grandmother who lived all of her life in Missouri, we used to go back and see the Cardinal birds. 
and it, it made me start paying attention to birds again that I normally don't pay attention to because when you're here in Colorado yeah. and you're in the same spot, you see the same birds over and over and over and over. And a lot of times it might be stellar jays or blue jays or magpies that are giving up your position in the landscape. And you just as soon rather not see that particular bird at that particular time. Yeah. But my, my ability to, to be fortunate and, and go on some excursions around the world in different States and different provinces. And just to see what you're talking about, just pay attention to the birds. We're all conservationists. Mm -hmm. We're all bird watchers. Oh, it's yeah. just a matter of if that's why we go into the woods or this just happens to be something that we subject ourselves to and enjoy all facts of nature. But I think we're all wildlife watchers, Oh, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, uh, but it's just, it's just that we have to look at things differently and from other people's perspectives, they want to go bird watch, go bird watch. I don't have a problem with that. I think that that's great. Right. If they want to go hunt, go hunt. If they want to fish, go fish. If you want to rock climb and, and ride mountain bikes, and 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 be a spelunker in the caves i don't have a problem with any of that but the the fact of the matter is none of that is an attempt to try to end something's life for our gratification or self-sustainability and that's mm -hmm. where other people have a problem with it they don't have a problem with us being outside until we actually pull the trigger or release the bow then they have a problem with it yeah yeah, yeah. it hurts their feelings um as we're wrapping things up here dan just talk about the upcoming i mean we've we've got to be campaigning pretty hard here as we head yeah. into november and you you know the last 30 days is probably going to be where we're going to see a lot of the ads and stuff uh we how much i don't know i don't know if you can comment on how much money we've raised uh but do talk about where that's going to be spent where can, so where will people see this stuff yeah and, I, and i'm going to do an ask too because we got sufficient uh, buy-in from the hunting and hook and bullet community um, nationwide over the last 11 months. So uh, the money, the money will be spent entirely on the campaign and the campaign will be a combination of social media and television and billboards and light rail wraps and, and op-eds and, and public events and door knocking and canvassing and circulating on the front range. Um, that takes money and and the buy of those television ads especially during a presidential election takes a significant amount of money what you could buy in april on a non-presidential election year is a, a probably about a tenth of the cost of what you could buy in the heat of the moment on a, a presidential election year when it comes to october uh, social media is the same way you do a social media ad to say that cable smith is a great guy uh, well, then then that's going to cost very little. You want to say Cable, Cable Smith is a great guy to be for president. Now it becomes a political ad. And, and what you might have been able to buy for a nickel now costs you five bucks. To be able to counter the opposition is something to where we need to be able to go toe for toe, tit for tat, and punch for punch with the opposition because they're going to send out lies and deceit and smoke and mirror games and shell games all over the place to where it takes money to be able to counter that. Uh, we have campaign managers hired. We've got a strategy company with PacWest Strategies. The Issues Committee is actually a subset of what CRWM or Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife is and was. It's still here. I'm still the executive director. But the campaign itself will be Colorado Wildlife Deserve Better. And if people want more information, they can go to wildlifedeservebetter.com and they can have a plethora of information that's available to them, including a toolkit that will be up and running, I think, today, since we have a ballot number, which is Proposition 127. That toolkit is something to where social media guys and news outlets and media outlets can be able to utilize that for distribution to get the message out about the science-based wildlife management and to make sure that there's a comprehensive, consistent outreach and education campaign. The reason that that's important for people to pay attention to, whether they live in Colorado or not, is because if we win on November 5th, we will have created a playbook and a roadmap that can be spread out and networked and utilized at any single level. And it's not just about the advertising side of it. It's building up to the point of culmination to the advertising side that we want to be able to share that roadmap with every single group, entity, state, organization, method of take, species of harvest, uh, season, if you're interested in defending what you have in your state or what species that you like to pursue, 
help support us in some capacity. And you can go to wildlifedeservebetter.com. You can still go to savethehuntcolorado.com. Mm. Two parallel movements go in the same direction, same intent, but the vote no campaign will come from Wildlife Deserve Better. And we would encourage people to pay particular close attention to the social media side of things because that's typically where our guys are going to be able to see stuff. They're not going to be watching the local edition of Hulu or Netflix probably talking about science-based wildlife management in the Denver metro area or the Boulder metro area. Right. Those are things that the general public can engage in. And at the same time, share and share alike as much of the information that you see that is relevant toward your beliefs about propping up science-based management and the North American model of wildlife conservation. We need people, when we turn around and kick something out and we've got 160,000 views in a week, we need people to comment. We need people to share. We need people to repost because it was not just going to the hunter. It is going to a lot of non-hunters that are seeing the message. Why? Because they trust the hunters that they know, that they're in their families, that sit around the Thanksgiving table, that they're coworkers with, that they're in their congregation. We can all be the ambassadors of each other's fight to be able to hit that non-hunting public. And without the ability to be able to do that, well, we're just talking to the choir. We're just watching right. the outdoor channel on Sunday in the snowstorm, waiting for the waiting for the weather to clear. We can talk to the people regularly. It's just that we don't do a very good job of it because they're not necessarily in our wheelhouse. It's not that they're not on our side. They just don't understand. Get off our asses and talk to the people that actually can make a difference that we have connections to that we see on a daily basis at the at the coffee shop or at the car wash or at the auto parts store or whatever. Just because they don't hunt doesn't mean that they don't want to know about it. And if they know that you're a hunter, they're more receptive to turn around and believe what you say as opposed to what some lunatic animal rights extremist says that that's the only message that they ever heard. So they're likely to turn on and fall on that side of the fence. We have mm -hmm. the opportunity here. But the two organizations, the supporters, that wildlife deserve better and the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management at SaveTheHuntColorado.com. All right. So you all go to those two outlets there. I mean, 10 bucks, whatever, 100 bucks, whatever you can afford. Uh, this takes money. It takes the United Front. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the most important anti-hunting measure that we've faced in my lifetime. Because we are, and like yeah. we said, we discussed it in, at the beginning of the show. This is the beginning of the end. If we lose, it's coming to your doorstep. And so we can't afford to lose. Bottom line. Uh, Dan, thanks again for the time, man. Thanks for, like I said earlier, just uh, the tireless effort that you're putting in here. It's, um, I don't want to say it's a thankless job because I'm, I'm sitting here thanking you. Uh, yeah. But I know that it's a tiring <laughs> job and the, the hours are long and, the, the stuff you like to do, hunt, trap, fish, uh, the opportunity to do that had to be shelved uh, because this is so important. So thank you for, for spearheading it, and your passion is uh, certainly unbridled on that front. So thank you very much, and thanks for the time today. Uh, if there's we, anything else I can do, let me know. I'm here to no, help. I appreciate, appreciate that. I mean, I, I, would, I would encourage people to follow us on Instagram and Facebook um, just to be able to stay in the know. We're going to try to – I mean, we put out – seven seven pieces a week is what we put out and uh it's not just my dumb ugly ass that's on there we put out a lot of good information a lot of facts a lot of data a lot of people that are speaking to the point follow us on instagram crwm follow us on facebook at the coloradans for responsible wildlife management we've got a youtube page up and uh you know there's a shopping cart on the website if people want to get engaged at that level and, and help promote through a product uh just just th this is part of the roadmap in the playbook that everybody can utilize once we win to be able to incorporate it in their state proactively and supposed to reactively. So Cable, we just appreciate the opportunity with you again. We'd like to come back on when we win. Yeah, absolutely. To turn around and prop a flag up and say, hey, this is what worked <laughs> and, and this is the, the margin that we won by and this is something that everybody can capitalize on because we got grander ideas on what to do at the next level. And we get done here in Colorado on this, we've got the Parks and Wildlife Commission that we have to deal with. We've got the legislative side that we have to deal with that we beat at every single level so far. Uh, but they're not going to stop here. Right. We're just going to hold them back a little bit, and they're going to try to they're going to try to regroup and rearm and refund and figure out how they can go somewhere else that maybe isn't as well organized as what we've created. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully uh, I look forward to celebrating on November 5th. You bet. Thanks, Kibble. Aim small, miss small.